1963, the FBI recorded New England Mafia boss Raymond Patriarca talking about the history of the powerful Genovese crime family. Let's check it out. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organized crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. Today, we're going to take a quick look at a conversation involving Mafia boss Raymond Patriarca, where he is discussing the Genovese crime family at length. In 1963, Raymond Patriarca, the boss of the New England Mafia, was recorded by an illegal FBI wiretap discussing the Genovese crime family with fellow mobsters Gennaro Jerry Angiulo and Peter Lamone. The conversation starts with Jerry Angiulo talking about Genovese mobster Thomas Tommy Ryan Eberly. The FBI transcript goes as follows. Jerry, I like Tommy's methods. He's exactly like, you know, Patty was supposed to be like us. And there was, I told you that there was a few things that I didn't see. You can call a spade a spade. But this Tommy, as of right now, he's really bought. He's really bought to the extent, listen, when I say bought, I mean for better. Jerry Angiulo, who would later become underboss to Raymond Patriarca, clearly stating that he highly rates the way that Tommy Ryan Eberly conducts business. Angiulo also mentions Genovese mobster Patty Era. Patty Era was Pasquale Patsy Era, who was a prominent member of the Genovese family's famous 116th Street crew. Patsy Era was close with Michael Trigger Mike Coppola. And Era would go on to become a powerful figure for the Genovese family in Florida. It appears that Jerry Angiulo is comparing Era and Eberly and is stating that he likes the way Tommy Ryan operates. Jerry Angiulo states that Pasquale Era was supposed to be like them, the Patriarcha, but that this wasn't the case. Raymond Patriarcha then continues the conversation about Tommy Ryan Eberly. The FBI transcript reads, Raymond, he's acting boss in New York in the absence of Vito. He was with Vito all the time, see? So when Vito went away, Vito put in a representation for him. And if I go away tomorrow, I want to put you in charge, sure. Raymond Patriarca stating that at that time in 1963, Tommy Ryan was acting boss of the Genovese crime family, while Vito Genovese was incarcerated. However, from FBI recordings of conversations involving Thomas Eberly himself, at this time in 1963, it was in fact Vito Genovese's underboss, Jerry Catina, who was the acting boss of the family. And Tommy Ryan was the acting underboss. From other FBI files and transcripts of wiretap recordings, we also learn that despite being acting underboss, Tommy Ryan did act at times as a very vocal member of the Genovese hierarchy in meetings with other families and that Jerry Katina, despite officially being acting boss, was happy for Eberly to be the figurehead of the family. This led to mutterings that Jerry Katina didn't want the role of acting boss and wasn't cut out for the position. So it is understandable that Raymond Patriarca would think that Tommy Ryan was acting boss in 1963. Raymond Patriarca also states in the recording, that he would want Jerry Angiulo to be acting boss of the family if he went to prison. As documented in the FBI transcript, Raymond Patriarca would continue the conversation, saying, That's Vito, that's the boss. In other words, he's the boss now. Lucky was the boss. When he went to the can and they got together and had an election, and then Vito was on the lam. Vito came back in 1944-45, but Frank at that time, there was a meeting. Frank told me that Frank never wanted to be the boss. See what I mean? So, here we have New England boss Raymond Patriarca 
providing his understanding of some of the history of the Genovese crime family. Let's look at some of the key points that he discusses. Starting off, we see that Raymond Patriarca categorically states that Vito Genovese is the boss of the family, even when he is incarcerated. Patriarca then gives a history of the family's leadership from the time of Charles Luciano. Patriarca states that Charlie Luciano was the boss, but after he was incarcerated in 1936, the Genovese family got together and had an election. Part of the conversation is inaudible, but we can determine that he is possibly saying that Vito Genovese was then elected acting boss. Patriarca then mentions how Vito Genovese went on the lam. As we know, Vito Genovese fled to Italy in 1937 to avoid murder charges in the United States. History shows us that Frank Costello then became acting boss. Patriarca then states how Vito Genovese returned to the United States in the mid-1940s and beat the murder charges that he was facing. All of this has been well documented by various sources. Raymond Patriarca then details some of his own personal recollections of conversations with some of the Genovese mobsters involved. After Vito Genovese returned from Italy, the crime family had a meeting, according to what Frank Costello personally told Patriarca. Patriarca then states that Frank never wanted to be the boss of the crime family. Again, this is something that has been documented by several sources. The FBI wiretap then can't pick up the next part of the conversation. But it appears that Patriarca has moved back to talking about Vito Genovese and what he personally told him at that time. Patriarca states, He said, I'm just back now. A lot of heat on. Let it stay the way it is. So, everything was going smooth. It appears from what Patriarca was saying is that instead of being angry that Frank Costello had replaced him as acting boss of the family in his absence, Vito was happy to stay in the background. In 1951, the mob was under the microscope at the famous Kefalfa hearings and Frank Costello came into the public eye. Patriarca would say of Costello, so, then when he started to get in trouble, like the family, you know what I mean, in 51, with the Kefalfa meeting, everything was, the guy was fighting for his freedom. And then, Patriarca would say of Vito Genovese at this time, so now, he ain't too much in the limelight. Vito wasn't as hot as Frank was, you know, so they started to take over. Patriarca stating, that the spotlight that Frank Costello was under from the media and law enforcement allowed Vito Genovese to start slowly taking over within the crime family, ultimately leading to the attempt on Frank Costello's life in 1957, with Vincent Giganti as the shooter. Patriarchal would say, They took the shot but missed. And that's the whole story. Raymond Patriarca then expands on Tommy Eberly's role in the Genovese crime family. The FBI transcript reads, Tommy put Vito with him, in charge over here, like he's, in fact, he's over Jerry. But the way he put it though, they figured Tommy is a little younger and he couldn't make no big decisions like, unless he sat down with Jerry and Mike, but he's ready to carry the ball. Patriarch is dating that Tommy Ryan Eberly is being groomed for the top spot in the family and that he considers him above Jerry Katina, who was officially the acting boss. Patriarca also states that because Thomas Eberly is relatively inexperienced in terms of being a member of the family's hierarchy, he has to run decisions past Jerry Katina and the family's conciliary, Mike Miranda. Jerry Angelo then states that he was unaware of Thomas Eberly being above Jerry Katina. The FBI transcript reads, Jerry, well, I'll say one thing, I didn't know that. But I'll tell you the same thing I just told you, I didn't know that. I thought the last thing they did was that he was representing Jerry. 
Mobster Peter Limone then asks Raymond Patriarca, how did the Genovese crime family move on after the failed attempt on Costello's life and Vito becoming boss? The FBI transcript reads, Peter, what they do, Raymond, after they tried again and they eyed it out. Raymond, yeah, what they should have done is, Frank wanted to get out. I'll tell you, there's a lot of jealousy going on. Raymond Patriarca then states that Vito Genovese was a good boss and respected across the country. The FBI transcript reads, Raymond, he was a good boss, but I mean, but not just here, everybody all over the country wanted, and you never see no trouble either. I guess he was foresighted because that's why he would never leave them guys in charge 100%. You understand what I mean? After Vito Genovese was incarcerated in 1959, Frank Costello was convicted on an income tax charge and would find himself in the same prison as the man who was the architect behind the attempt on his life. Inside prison, Vito Genovese and Frank Costello sorted out their differences, as I've covered in a previous video, and the link to this is in the comments below. After Frank Costello leaves prison, Vito Genovese sends word that Costello is reinstated as a soldier in the family and that he is not to be touched. Raymond Patriarca expands on this, as per the FBI transcript. Raymond. But with Vito, Vito was. Because I guess for them to iron it out the way they did in the can, for him to send word back out that Frank is out, leave him alone, he's back in, you know, He's back in at Soldier, but nobody would touch him. Another interesting point that Raymond Patriarca makes is with regards to the Lucchese crime family. Patriarca would say, The only good family there now is Tommy Brown's. Tommy Brown, of course, being the nickname for Thomas Lucchese. And perhaps Patriarca's statement is an indication of how Tommy Lucchese ran his family and the stability that there was in his criminal organisation. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.